in numerical analysis or even differential equations, um, qualitative statements. So people saying there is some constant and makes the mapping bounded, but I would like to have I would say good, suboptimal, uh, but easy to understand and verifiable constants. So it's not the question of best constants like um, yeah, uh, LP estimates or so, but also Babenko uh, and so on, but uh, to have good estimates which are reliable and not too far from the truth. So I have written up two versions where you would, uh, where you see how the ideas of numerical analysis, functional analysis, and, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, concept harmonic analysis come together. So you have maybe an operator which might be a pseudo differential operator or something um, kind of reasonable that you know a lot about theoretically. And then I would like to be able to compute some approximation um, and the approximation operator may depend on the F maybe not on individual Fs, but uniformly for finitely many or compact subsets of this. And you want to approximate it so that your customer who is asking you, can you compute this uh, T of F uh, up to epsilon error in some norm? Um, that is something that I would like to be able to, to carry out. So in, in that sense, uh, um, you have the forward problem and of course also this kind of inverse problem. You have an equation, uh, you have a description of the ingredients and you would like to have an approximation of the solution. Again, maybe some other function space norm and for concrete tasks, it may be useful to be familiar with the function spaces that could help you to, to provide the answer. Now, um, I thought it's the easiest thing to first tell you not so much <coughs> how to construct these spaces, but what are the properties that make make this space a useful uh, space. And I'm also planning to, to write a kind of axiomatic approach. And uh, there are indications that there are not many choices. And, and in a way, if you think of this again as a functor, so some some mapping which assigns to each locally compact abelian group some Banach space of continuous integrable functions, then S0, as I call it, is seems to be the only space. So uh, some people honored me by calling it the fighting algebra. In the book of Charlie Grochenig, it's called M1, the modulation space, which is related to L1. But for me, it's a replacement for the C, uh, for the uh, short space, therefore I was calling it as S, and the zero indicates that it's a minimal guy in, in a certain family. So what is it? I mean, what are the basic properties? It's a Banach space of continuous integrable function. It's a pointwise Banach algebra, compactly supported elements form a dense subspace. It's isometrically invariant under the Fourier transform. So three plus four give you, it must be also a Banach algebra with respect to convolution. And the translation is isometric on the space. Again, four with five give you the translation on the free transform must, side must be isometric, which means multiplication with exponential, with complex exponential functions or with our elements from the dual group are invariant. So if you combine the time shift with the frequency shift you're getting a time frequency shift, as we call it. And these are also elements that you can get from, I mean, to, just to use big words, from the represent, Schrodinger representation of the reduced Heisenberg group. Now, for an engineer, it just says, well, I'm interested in signals, but if I don't know the offset, everything should be translation invariant. And then if we go to the free transform side, we would like to know that the space is also invariant on the free transform side and that that's more or less uh, where this minimality came in from. If you give me any space like LP, we know LP norms are translation invariant, but also if you modulate, you don't change the absolute value of a function. So LP spaces have this property by the minimality as zero is inside of LP and by kind of duality, every LP or LQ function is inside of the dual space. So that, that makes the space a good environment for, for the objects that we are using. Now maybe just uh, making more explicit the time shift operator and the so-called frequency shift or modulation operator 
and they are known, of course, I mean, the justification of why is M called a modulation, a frequency shift operator, because if you look at the output on the Fourier transform side, it's just a frequency shift. So musicians say it's a transposition, you are playing a different tune and uh, they are commuting up to phase factors, not all the time. And the main ingredient uh, in time frequency analysis is actually the short time Fourier transform, which we denote as VGF. V stands for voice transform. That was the original terminology introduced by Grossman and so on and his colleagues. And, and but we write it as representation coefficient. So you're giving me a signal f, I'm choosing a nice decent function, typically a Gauss function, and I correlate my signal with uh, these billing blocks. So I'm kind of taking a sensor, like a metallic sensor detector or so, and ask, well, how much energy is in my piece of music at the given time and at the given frequency? So that's how you can think of this function. And usually I, I show you some pictures. So here is a list of, well, I'm, I'm sometimes r running the STX program of my colleague, Peter Balaj, or my student, former student, Peter Balaj. And if I see something very nice, I do a screenshot. So this is a piece of a Beethoven, uh, Mozart, piano, sonata. Uh, here you see a spectrogram of a cello. You see the guy is doing a very strong vibrato. Um, of course, Maria Callas, when she is doing a coloratura, it looks a bit crazy or it looks very rough, as opposed to maybe a nice organ which would have very simple minded flat histogram. Or if you take uh, uh, one of those famous tenors, you understand why they have such a wide noise. Uh, voice because they have they're able with their voice to create the same vibrato that you have in the cello or so. Okay, and now comes the definition of both the norms and when is a function in in a zero simply when this short term Fourier transform, let's say with respect to a Gauss function, is integrable. Uh, now it's a simple rule that you can say because of the free invariance of the Gauss function. The, yeah, that uh, rot uh, applying the Fourier transform is more or less the same as applying a rotation of 90 degree of this spectrogram. So you all think that a pure frequency should be something which is a horizontal line. And if you think of the Fourier transform of a pure frequency in the distributional sense, it should be a Dirac. Well, a Dirac is something having all the frequencies built in. So that's a horizontal line goes to vertical line and so on. So uh, that's making it clear that this norm is invariant on the Fourier transform. And uh, there is also a Moyal equation which says if you normalize your window G in L2, then this um, is an, a, an unitary mapping, not surjective, but the energy that you have in this spectrogram is the same as the energy in the signal. So you're spreading out your energy very much like, I mean, you take the spectrogram squared, it's a probability measure if your function is in a normalized element in L2. Here is just a summary that this is uh, having all these properties with the minimality property. And again, recall, we're talking now about uh, these uh, three uh, layers of the thing. Now, um, why, how can we use this? So assume uh, this would have been one of the classical spaces uh, at the time when the FFT was introduced. And then it turns out that uh, this uh, engineering spirit of, well, how can I compute if we transform? Well, I take enough samples and then I hope that uh, the FFT will provide samples of the free transform. This is, of course, not correct, but you can say, well, the correct way of thinking of it is if you start with a nice function and you're uh, periodizing it, then sampling it in a compatible way, then you're getting the same on the free transform where the role of the periodization parameter and the sampling parameter are interchanged. So maybe I'm 
taking period 12 for sampling rate 1 over 12, uh, then I get the same on the free transform with interchange roll, but it's symmetric. But I'm ending up with a sequence, and then I have to take this sequence and do something to plot it. Now, MATLAB would do a plot with piecewise linear interpolation, but you can do cubic quasi interpolation. And we had this result that was a really building stone for our theory that if you're doing, doing this, I mean, you're more or less, you're taking samples over an interval, which contains most of the information of your function in the zero, they're all well decaying in a nice way. Then uh, you're applying the F of T, so you're replacing the F by F hat, and then you're doing piecewise linear interpolation in a smooth way. Then you're getting a good approximation, but not only in L1 or L2, but in the S0 sense. So, of course, for the statement to be interesting, you have to think that S0 should be a big space. Yes, it's fairly big, it's much bigger than the Schwartz space, but it's not containing uh, uh, step functions, it's not containing non-integrable functions. So step functions are not okay, but already piecewise linear functions so with nodes at the integer points, uh, which are in L1, are already in S0. So, and then piecewise linear interpolation, for example, on the output side, keeps you in S0. And so this is a good way of such an idea. So my procedure, you're asking me, can I have um, for a given function f, um, the operator is the Fourier transform in the continuous spirit. Um, and you give me an epsilon and say, well, I would like to have the strongest possible norm, and that should be less than epsilon. And I'm saying, yes, this procedure will, will do the job. You just have to sample your function on a long enough interval, put everything into a FFT routine, uh, do the piecewise linear interpolation and you are guaranteed to have good approximation in any of the LP norms. So that's kind of a good way. And if you look at pictures, the, there is some partition of unity, which is simply a sequence of triangular functions. The weighted sum of those triangles is nothing else but the piecewise linear interpolation with the node points here. So this is, I took something where you can see what, what you're doing and that you're getting something reasonable and if you refine it more and more you will have a zero convergence once more this is very strong convergence if you say well my function was originally smooth i would like to have a smooth interpolation i'm just doing this quasi interpolation and you see here i take a fairly wide uh, 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 partition of unity that's why you see some bigger areas in terms of maximal deviation but if you shrink this partition of unity you get something which is I'm kind of as close as this one and as smooth as this one, just to give you an idea. Now, uh, the other place where in a classical situation a zero comes in is uh, summability. So Ferenc Weiss was studying all the classical kernels when he was visiting me many years ago, and he couldn't find a single one which was not in a zero. We all know there is trouble with Dirichlet a kernel which corresponds to rectangular function or sync function on the time side, so they're not good. But all the others, you just say, well, my free transform from L1 might not be in L1, it might be not integrable. But if you multiply it with some function in S0, S0 is uh, integrable, F hat is bounded, so you get a bounded function, so this integral exists, but also S0 is free invariant, so Instead of stretching the summability kernel, of course, you're creating on the time side a convolution kernel which tends to the Dirac. So you have a Dirac sequence convolved with your function f. So instead of writing it as f of x in the pointwise sense, think of this right hand side is a smoothed version, and then you take the limit and for any decent norm like LP norm for P less than infinity and so on, it will be nicely convergent. So that's that's another application. Now there's a nice joke saying that Poisson's formula is not always valid, which simply means that absolute convergence on both sides is not enough. Why not? Because if you go through the proof, you're taking an integrable function in L1, you're periodizing it and you're getting a function on the torus, which is in L1. You look at its free coefficients, which are the samples of the function on the free transform side. 
we call I have the two pi i in the exponent. And so this is just expanding a function in the Fourier series and e to the i zero is zero is just one. So the right hand side is just the Fourier series expansion at x equals zero. And the left hand side is the periodized function at x equals zero. And as we know, L1 is not good enough to grant uh, pointwise convergence at every point. Now, Kahan and Le Marier had a paper in the 90s where they showed you can even have slight decay uh, and still have problems with this identity. And Charlie Grochenig was showing that, well, exactly if the weighted conditions on both sides are strong enough to grant that you're inside of a zero, you have this, and otherwise you, this formula may fail. Now, the Fourier transform invariance of the function implies that you have a Fourier transform of uh, by duality of the of the dual space. So the Fourier transform of a mild distribution is the functional which applied to f is nothing else but the functional applied to the Fourier transform. It's nice to observe that the Dirac comp, uh, due to these nice decay properties uh, or summability properties, better, uh, uh, are bounded linear functions. So essentially, for a function in S0, we know that the upper Riemann sum, even taking over the full real line or Euclidean space, will be finite. That means that this infinite linear combination of Dirac comps not just uh, weighted sums with uh, which are bounded measures. So this unbounded measure is still a bounded linear functional. And combining uh, the Poisson formula with this abstract view on the Fourier transform just says, well, at the end, it just says that the Fourier transform in the sense of these distributions of the Dirac comp is the Dirac comp. It's not new for everybody who has used this with template distributions, but I don't need template distributions. Now, what is sampling? Sampling is uh, multiplying with the Dirac comp. So you're getting a weighted sum now. In our case, if the function f uh, is bounded in continuous, you have a sequence in L infinity. But if you are in starting with a zero, it would be even an L1 function. It would be a bounded measure. So you would say, yes, this has a free transform. And the free transform, of course, of a pointwise product is the convolution of the free transforms. Now, this is just uh, the, uh, the comp, and so you get that sampling on the time side gives you periodization on the free transform side. Of course, you can dilate uh, these Dirac comps, then you have narrow sampling, wide periods, and so on. But you can also use it to give a quite simple proof, um, which is mathematically correct or suitable for engineers. I really have tried to do this at the ETH Zurich uh, one year, one and a half years ago in the course, um, to show the Shannon sampling theorem. So. What happens if you do a sampling of such a smooth function and you see here the spectrogram? Well, it means that you have this sampled version. Blue and green are real and imaginary part. And we have seen that this sampling corresponds to periodization. Now, if you count the number of repetitions, you know the sampling distance here. So it's kind of quite a few samples, but also it's a narrow spectrum. So that, in that sense. So how would you come back from, from this sampled version to this? We know the Fourier transform is isometric now in this, even in this big world of mild distributions. So how can I back, come back from the lower part to the upper part? And you see already the indication here. You multiply on the Fourier transform side with the red object. And then, of course, the red object should be such that it reproduces the inner part and it removes or uh, deletes all the outer parts. Well, and if you try to do it and write it, well, multiplication with the red function is the same as convolution with the, with the, with the inverse Fourier transform. So if this is a function which is in a zero, you have just to convolve it. And of course, with this measure, and that means that you write, you're coming to the Shannon reproduction formula. So you take the sampling values, you come Let me know if you will get here. 
Something happens with the voice? Yeah. No, From the first finger, we, we cannot hear. Rola, do you also unmute your microphone? Yes. Okay. But we have to unmute. Unmute. Professor Fechtinger, that's the main task. Ah, you. Wow, I cannot unmute him. Can ah, you hear yes. me now? Yes, yes, now we can hear. No, no, no. Okay, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm not, I have actually not, <laughs> I think I have not moved, whatever. I whatever. cannot understand how it happened, sorry. Yeah, no, no problem, no problem, yeah. So I don't I'll know continue. where I was getting lost. Yeah. <laughs> we <you> too. Get... <laughs> yeah. did, did you hear my... my yes, yes, part? everything is perfect. Yeah, so this is kind of the visual, the point is the visual demonstration uh, of the recovery from the sampled version can be turned into correct mathematical terminology. So if you use the right function spaces, you can do it. I don't want to spend too much time on this. Now, uh, yeah, maybe just the comment, the LP spaces are subspaces of a zero prime. So our, even for P larger than two, the Fourier image of LP is well-defined. Oh yeah, that's a typo. So you can work with FLP spaces or so. And I don't want to talk about modulation spaces today, but essentially they are amalgam spaces, which are FLP on the Fourier transform side with the global summability behavior. Now, the next part is a quick review of engineering approach to time invariant systems. So we in mathematics would say, well, we're discussing multipliers or free multipliers or operators which commute with time, with, with time shifts. So uh, for me, a person in functional analysis is interested in all the bounded linear operators between two Banach spaces. As a harmonic analyst, I'm for example, interested in all the operators which are moving, going from one translation invariant space to another translation invariant space of functions or distributions and which commute with translations. And actually I have developed a, a, a new approach to convolution. So if you give me any locally compact for simplicity abelian group, I would be able to explain to you without any measure theory what uh, convolution of bounded measures is. So I'm starting from the idea that, well, bounded functions are clear, functionals on the simple space, so the elements of C0 dual space, I call them bounded measures, and it's justified, of course, by Ries representation theorem. And I'm saying there's some action. I can convolve this functional with a function and in order to be consistent with the usual terminology, I take the function, flip it, shift it by x, and apply my functional. And in, in the framework of the course and our paper, corresponding paper, I was showing, well, you can show that any operator is arising in this way. And of course, if you're asking, well, well, an ordinary shift operator that should correspond also to a functional, then you find out it will be a Dirac measure with the shift parameter. And uh, you can prove a lot of things. So you get a algebra of um, algebra structure on the bounded measures. So it's like saying, well, in linear algebra, you have these linear mappings, they are of interest. You're storing the information about linear mappings by storing the uh, images of a basis vector put them into a scheme which you call a matrix. And then you're asking, well, given two matrices corresponding to linear operators, what is the matrix corresponding to the product of the operators? And you have some rules to do matrix multiplication. So I'm just introducing convolution of measures by saying, well, that's the law of concatenating two two functionals to get uh, some, some um, uh, new, which corresponds to the composition. So we all know Dirac X convolved with Dirac Y should be Dirac X plus Y, and that should be the backbone of the argument. Now, the good thing, because a zero is consisting of continuous function, and some 
extra properties which I ignore for the moment, but the scheme is very simple. If you're saying, well, I'm now interested in, not in, that's a bit more difficult, uh, but we can do it, but all the operators on a zero, but from a zero to a zero prime. So I would say, well, somebody is coming up and saying, in the book of Larson on the multiplier theory, he describes the operators mapping from LP to LQ and he finds out that pseudo measures are not good enough. You need quasi measures. They are very abstract objects or so. And I'm saying, well, if you go from LP to LQ, you restrict the domain to a zero. You embed the domain into a zero prime. So it will be an operator going from a zero to a zero prime. And then the story turns out to be extremely easy. It's exactly, it's some functional which you apply to this flipped and shifted version. So it's exactly the same uh, method, only it's a different pair of duality or so. And then of course, uh, I don't do this. Uh, then you say, well, but now can I write it as a convolution operator and we have everything that you need. The sigma, this is the impulse response, has a Fourier transform. We can do multiplication on the Fourier transform side and we have therefore a transfer function and everything that engineers use and they usually do it actually with with mystifying the use of the Dirac measure which is kind of a the great thing I use the Dirac measure has the sifting properties and I'm saying yes this is very exciting if you apply the identity operator and ask me what is the output at a given point x then you have to evaluate your function f at x because identity of f is f and the value of this identity of f at x is f of x. So for me, this sifting properties is nothing miraculous. It's kind of a trivial evidence of such properties or so. Now, uh, I just mentioned one other thing in my advisor, Hans Reiter's book, there's a, a chapter about the spectrum. So this goes back to the work of Berling. And so what is the spectrum of a function, a bounded function, and it's done very indirectly but it's very easy. It's just the support of the free transform. So you have to find a way to define the support of such a mild distribution that's done in the usual way. It has a free transform and then you're having this notion. Now for a signal analysis person, it's more or less nice to say, well, these are all the frequencies that we're talking about for analysis, which are in the signal. So you're trying to filter those frequencies we are in the Fourier domain, you're filtering out those frequencies which are, uh, which can be filtered out of this. So what does it mean? You're having a sequence, maybe an unbounded sequence of test functions, and in the weak star sense, you're getting uh, the pure frequencies and output. What does it mean? <laughs> a function is in the spectrum, if you look at the pure frequency, which is an oscillating thing, and if you're able to approximate this pure oscillation, over a long interval quite accurately or so. So this is Fourier analysis. How do you do Fourier synthesis? You're saying, well, I'm approximating my object in the L infinity sense. Well, in the weak star sense of L infinity and by linear combinations of those frequencies which are found in the, in the signal. And then we have this magic and mysterious result about non-spectral synthesis of Malyavar and so on which says that in R3 you can find situations where this is not possible. So you cannot recover the, the bounded function from its pure frequencies or so. Okay, so uh, the last thing that I would like to mention is um, to mention at least a little bit of uh, operator theory is the so-called kernel theorem. I think there, that still has to be explored or so further, but we all know that in linear algebra we are studying uh, the operators by looking at matrix analysis. So we choose a basis and then we know how to describe properties of the matrix by manipulating the basis. So what is the rank uh, and so on. How can we invert it? Well, we have matrix multiplication, we invert it or so. Now, I think physicists are more likely to say, well, now we choose a new form of basis. It's just a Dirac basis. So function is a collection of these continuous values of the functions and they use it to describe it this way. 
And so you would expect that every operator is an integral operator. So the KXY of an integral operator is more or less uh, the continuous version of a matrix. Now, uh, this may be dangerous because harmless operators like identity operator or diagonal operator are not okay. I mean, you expect a diagonal operator should be supported on the diagonal, but what is uh, happening if you're looking at a two, you're gi somebody is giving you a diagonal operator which is supported on a set of measures zero, so that will be the zero operator, so you're not getting anything out of it. Now, there is a well-known theory in functional analysis, but only of limited use, that's the Hilbert-Schmidt theory. So you're saying, yes, if you are restricting yourself not to arbitrary operators, but to those specific compact operators which have additional properties of singular values square summable, uh, you call them Hilbert-Schmidt operators, then you can find an L2 function. So you have some some class of operators and usually you go on and you say well there are trace class operators and Schutten class operators and the dual of trace class is the space of all bounded operators or so but I was very first surprised and then very happy actually to find out that in our setting we can do the same thing and that's surprising because clearly the Schwartz space is not a nuclear Frisch space, it's a Banach space, it's infinite dimensional, so it's not a Frisch space. So there, why should there be a nucleus or a kernel theorem? And it turned out to be quite easy. So the key property is this one. You have uh, a zero projective tensor product with a zero is a zero of two variables. So there are Wilson bases where you can say L1 of a product is nothing else but the tensor product of L1. So what, what is L1 matrices, so to say? They're infinite linear combinations of unit vectors and the coefficients are in L1. So that looks almost trivial or so, but it's not trivial, but it's not so deep or so. Now, uh, if you take product functions of two variables, you take the absolute convergent ones and then you take, there are many, many representations, you take the infimum norm, you have an uh, uh, understanding of how this works. So you're taking functions in the first and the second variables, you have this very strong convergence, and you're doing this. So if you, for example, you would take C0 here and here, uh, the dual space would be the space of by measures, which is larger than bounded measures and so on, but here you can do it. Now, the nice thing is that, uh, we can get a, again a Banach Gelfand triple isomorphism which extends the Hilbert Schmidt operator pairing, which says, well, the very good Hilbert Schmidt operators are corresponding to L2 kernels or integral kernels. This can be extended to a triple. So you are saying, well, if my inside L2 of, of, of two variables, you can find a zero of two variables. So what are the operators which are in L2? And it turns out, well, these are the very nice operators. Actually, the operators which map going, uh, I didn't write it down here, I guess. Yeah, I'll probably talk a little bit more. These are the operators which we call the inner kernel theorem, which map a zero prime into a zero. So in a discrete setting, you will say, well, what are the matrices which map L infinity to L1? You have to really say matrices because some operators are not having a matrix representation. So you should say, I'm interested in the weak start to norm continuous operators from a zero prime to a zero. And they turn out to be exactly those kernel operators which are in a zero. And on the other hand, you have the biggest possible space. Now, what is the biggest possible set of operators? This is a zero prime, so the outer layer. What is uh, the most general class of, of operators that we have here in the Banach space setting? Well, go from the smallest to the biggest one. Now, uh, if I ask a student, how do you get the entries of a matrix? Um, um, if, if I describe to you in geometric terms the operator, the linear operator, let's say from R3 to R3, and then, of course, the answer should be, well, I have to look where the unit vectors go. 
And then I'm taking the coordinates of the unit vectors as the row vectors. So the second unit vector will give me the second column of the matrix. Do the same thing here. This operator, if it maps the dual space, I can insert delta of y. Now I have a continuous function which has values of k of x, y. So this typical reproducing kernel Hilbert stuff. And so we get the kernel and this is all, all justified and it extends in a unique way by kind of Plancherel argument to the Hilbert-Schmidt operators and by duality to this uh, general situation or so. So uh, you see here, this is the rule k of x, y in the inner case. There is an upcoming paper, it's still, uh, we have submitted the revision with Mats Jakobsen on this inner kernel theorem where we are doing all the functional analysis which you really have to do. So a description is this. Look at the kernels, which are functions in the simple case, uh, operators from Rd to Rd, which are kernels on R2D. And they describe these three spaces. And here you have uh, the Hilbert-Schmidt operators. And the usual scalar product is, of course, the trace of the first, let's say, scalar product Hilbert-Schmidt operators of T with S is you compose T with S conjugate, then you get a trace class operator and you take the trace. In the case of matrices, this is just the Frobenius scalar product. You're saying matrices are elements of the Euclidean space of dimension n squared or so. But this is the trace. And so uh, you can do it with two Hilbert-Schmidt operators, but you can also extend it to a pairing for the very good operator with a very nasty operator. So at the level of kernels, it's obvious how to do it. At the level of operators, it's not so completely obvious, but we can do it also. And I don't talk in about this anymore because my time is almost over. If you would take an element from this space, you could put here a, a pure time frequency shift. So clearly an operator on L2 is belonging to this space. And then the set of all the scalar products is a kind of operator-free transform. It's known to be the spreading function of those good operators. And then we have another continuous Banach, Gelfand, Triple. And so, yeah, I have written down these formulas, but uh, we don't bother now anymore. Uh, there's the Kohn-Nierenberg connection. The symplectic Fourier transform connects this spreading function with the Kohn-Nierenberg. Uh, yeah, I just want to mention, we use this to describe, for example, the best approximation of an operator by a Gabor multiplier. A Gabor multiplier is an extension, or as a multiplier where you ex multiply the Gabor coefficients. Uh, I'm willing, of course, to share the slides. So this is a list of papers on this Banner von triple. Uh, and um, of course, I have not talked anything about modulation spaces and why these spaces are useful for GABA analysis, which is kind of recovering from samples of the short term free transform. Or even more generally, it was motivating for COVID theory, where we tried long ago to connect short term free transform theory, modulation space theory, in analogy with continuous wavelet transform frames of uh, AX plus B group trivial distorting spaces and so on, yeah. Let me just see, I think it's uh, time to stop. So, uh, if you want to look at other talks, uh, I'm uh, promoting this um, site uh, and um, wanted to mention once more that this STX program can be downloaded from the web page of the Acoustic Research Institute in Vienna, uh, the so-called ARI where Peter Balaj is uh, the boss now. Okay, thank you very much for your attention and I hope it was not overloading you. <laughs> no way. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Feichtinger, for your very excellent and informative talk. And now questions, please. Questions. If somebody ready to questions or comments. <clears throat> I am Dariela de from Tbilisi. I have one comment. And so, uh, yes. your, your comments after nuclear fresher space are not appropriate. It is not complete. The only, you are underlying the only completeness. But why nuclear fresher space? It, it needs more explanation, I see. 
<laughs> uh, well, I'm referring to the book of Trev on uh, topological vector spaces, uh, mm -hmm. where so there is some statement. Uh, I mean, of course, we all know that if you want to describe linear operators, you're, it's likely to use uh, topological tensor products. And when you want to know that the projective and the injective tensor products, I think that's the terminology, are equal, then you need a nuclear Frechet space. Uh, and so the, the kind of the wrong, and so, so kind so, of it gives people the intuition that you need a nuclear space to have a kernel theorem. And that's of course- turns Yes, out to this, be not is, this is correct, of course. But yeah. what, uh, let's just know that the German mathematician, you know, Alfred Witt's book, yes, nuclear, uh, nuclear locally convex spaces. He he made free from tensor products this theory of nuclear spaces. It is useful. Nuclear locally convex spaces. So, Albrecht, sorry, I didn't catch the yeah. name. Probably I know the name. Who who was it? Albrecht Pitch. Ah, Pitch. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I know in person. Uh, you know. In person. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we know him personally. So, of course, the kernel theorem is there too. Of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so, it was nice. We, we not, 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 not everything we could follow you, but we, now we know that such a matter exists. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The further questions, please. If nobody, I have a question. Oh, very good. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, Professor Heitinger, uh, what about uh, you? You are talking that uh, these results uh, can are valid also for general uh, abelian groups, uh, Fourier transform yes. from yes. the abelian groups. What about non abelian groups, for example, for Heisenberg groups? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, the original definition was. Uh, of this space was to, to construct it with uniform partitions of unity. So somehow you would say, well, first you're starting to have a Fourier algebra and then mm -hmm. you're kind of decomposing it to pieces of equal size. And mm -hmm. then you're uh, saying that these, this particular decomposition should be absolutely convergent. Mm -hmm. So if you are giving me a Heisenberg group, uh, uh, we can use the AMR construction, PRA MAR construction to define the Fourier algebra. And uh, then we, we can find the, such partitions of unity exists also, which are kind of uh, bounded in, the, in this algebra or so, and you can define the space. I stopped, I mean, I tried to work on this space, but I stopped working because uh, these nice functorial properties that I get in the abelian case, uh, did not work out or require uh, more more extra properties. So you remember if you have the Fourier algebra, I mean, what yeah, what are the functorial properties? I didn't mention them properly. Uh, if you restrict the Schwartz function to a subgroup, you get a function in the Schwartz space. And that's the same is true with here. Uh, if you have an isomorphism, then you, everything is finer. So, so Fourier transform is mapping a zero of G to a zero of G hat. Of course, this is not meaningful in the non-abelian setting. And then I, re I mean, I was studying papers of Karl Hertz, and then you are in, uh, you need extra conditions. So maybe if the group is amenable, or if you have a normal subgroup, then you could prove such results or so. And so essentially I was, so yeah, I saw so many things to be done, and then wavelet theory came up, and we tried to connect with wavelet theory, that I didn't follow up. Also, there there are some papers, few papers by Nicky Schrank. He was having an operator theoretical approach to these spaces. I, I thought that this is more. Uh, it's probably a kind of a fresh approach to the non-abelian setting. So yes, yes, you can do these amalgam spaces on any group. And if you take the abstract Fourier algebra as local component, this might be useful spaces. Um, but at the moment, I'm or still for myself, I did I decided not to go in this direction. Yeah. So, but it's it's a possible choice. Yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, another question which I which I have you you told me uh, you told us that uh, 
spectra of these uh, some convolution operators, of course, yeah. uh, coincides with the support of the Fourier transform of the kernel. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but um, the, it it perhaps in L two space because in L P space there we have the Igari result, which says that uh, the even the uh, if uh, we have continuous multiplier. And it is uh, elliptic, no, non-zero becomes no, not zero. It, it is not invertible, need, not in all cases. Then the spectrum does not coincide with the support of the function uh, of the Fourier transform. But in L two, it's true, of course. Well, uh, first answer is uh, I, if I ref I was referring to uh, I think chapter seven or so, so one of the chapters of the book of Hans Reiter. So, uh, and, and I can tell you, I mean, it, but he refers to Berling, um, that you have to define the spectrum of an, in, an infinity function in a very indirect way. So essentially mm -hmm. you're saying, well, there's uh, an annihilating, so the kernel of the convolution operator, which maps L1 into L infinity will be a closed ideal. So you define the co-spectrum of that closed ideal. So, and then you're saying, well, the complement of the co-spectrum with something that we call the spectrum. So I have studied this as a student and later on, and, and I found it, well, quite tricky or so. And until I realized that at least this approach to the spectrum of an L infinity function defined in this classical way is the same that we would have here. Uh, I'm not sure that the, maybe one has to be careful with the notion of a spectrum in the sense of functions, measurable functions, and the spectrum in the sense of distributions. So mm -hmm. here I'm referring to distributions. We have here um, the pre-dual, I mean a zero is locally like the Fourier algebra. So you have mm -hmm. test functions of arbitrary small support, and yes. a point is in the complement of the support if the local action is trivial near this point. So all the all the functions which have very tiny support near this point are mapped to zero. Then you're saying, well, the, the distribution is not having any action here. And so clearly you get an open set and the complement is what you would call the support of a distribution. But that's the standard definition, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, maybe somebody has still questions. If nobody, it, no question, no comments, no remarks. <laughs> and we thank Professor Feichtinger again. And uh, let us hope that in the uh, nearest future he will, he will contribute his talk again to our seminar. We'll be very glad. Thank you, yeah, Professor Feichtinger. It could be more technical thing uh, at some point. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the hospitality. Yeah. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hans, uh, for okay. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody who was present on this talk. Goodbye. 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 Goodb